Hello world, Noah here, and welcome to lecture five of CS University. In this lecture, we're going to be talking about strings. The string is one of the most important data types in Python. Uh, this is something that you'll use in pretty much any program. Definitely something that you want to master. And I'll warn you in advance, although you can probably already tell, uh, this lecture is probably going to be pretty long because there's quite a bit to cover about strings. So first, my favorite question, what is a string? Well, a string is a sequence of letters, numbers, or symbols inside of quotation marks. And we've already seen strings before, and I've, you know, said that they're strings, but we're going to learn, you know, all about, you know, what exactly strings are and how exactly they work. Um, but a string, again, is just a sequence of, of characters um, inside of quotation marks. And so, for example, in our very first... Uh, lab where we were setting everything up we printed out hello world which is every programmer's first program and this right here is a sequence of letters numbers and symbols there's no numbers here but it's okay so it's a sequence of letters and symbols um, inside of quotation marks right here are the quotation marks there's one and there's another one so that right there is a string. So from day one, we've been working with strings, even if we don't completely understand, you know, how exactly they work. And so first I should mention that when we say letters, numbers, or symbols, uh, collectively we call these characters. And so that's a word that I'm going to use pretty frequently. It's a word that you'll see, um, you know, online. It's, you know, a more well-defined in other languages like Java. Uh, for example, um, and C and C++ and all of those. Um, but a, a character is a single letter, number, or symbol. And so a string is just a sequence of characters. And so you want to know the word character. And I just have here, um, you know, you can use single quotes, you can use double quotes. It doesn't matter which one you use. I personally prefer single quotes, but if you prefer double quotes, you're more than welcome to use them. You can also use triple quotes. You can use three quotation marks. These can be, you know, triple of the double quotes or triple of the single quotes. I realize that sounds a little confusing, um, but this will allow you to write multi-line strings. And so here, you know, we have the opening and the closing, and you can write, you know, on multiple lines in between there. So if you want to write a long message to print out, for example, um, you could use a multi-line string. Maybe you'd find that useful. And so, um, and so that's it. Basically, these are the three ways that you can make a string. Um, and so let's actually look at how strings work. So the first thing that we should talk about is indexing of strings. So in a string, you know, here's here's an example variable right here. And I realize that I used uh, double quotes, but that's OK. So name equals Noah, the string Noah. This is, you know, a simple variable. We have a decent amount of experience with variables at this point. So there's no nothing tricky there at all. Um, what we could do is, you know, every word, sorry, every letter, every character of that string has a position in that string, right? I mean, you can just look at it and say, okay, the first letter is an N and the last letter is an H and, you know, there's an O and an A in there and whatever. So, um, so it's, you know, pretty simple. Um, but it's actually really important in programming, you know, this, this concept of the position of these, of these characters. And so we call these positions indices, and the singular is index. So we can look at the index of each character. And so what I'll do in this nice table is I'll write out the letters N, O, A, H. This is just a table, you know, for us to think about things, um, but it's pretty helpful in that sense. And so, you know, the, the, the positions or the indices are pretty easy to figure out with one uh, minor caveat, and that is that string indices start at zero, not at one. So when I said that this n right here is the first uh, character in programming, we would say it's the zeroth character. And that may sound kind of weird because we're all used to counting from one instead of from zero, but it actually makes a lot of sense in, in programming. And you know, as we go through and learn more, I think that will become more clear. So for now, you know, I always hate to say it, but take my word for it that it makes sense and and eventually you'll come to see you know why it makes sense 
Um, but anyways, we can assign each of these, you know, the position. So n is zero, and then we just count up zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, so on. And so these, this is, you know, these are the indices right here. And so if I asked you what's the zeroth character of the string, you would say it's n, capital N. If I said what's the second, you would say it's a, and so on and so forth. If I asked you, you know, what's the tenth character, obviously there isn't one, and so the program would, you know, give an error message. But that's the general idea, is that you start counting from zero, and every character has, you know, an index, it has a position. So now let's take a look at how to actually use these indices in our code. And so again, let's you know, go with this variable that we have called name. And so what we can do is we can access individual characters out of that string. So for example, we can do something like name. If we wanna get the zeroth character, we can write in square brackets the index, which is zero. And so if I do this, you know, it will give me uh, an uppercase n, which is what we expect. And so basically the idea there, you know, is you write the name of the, the string variable, and then inside of these square brackets, you write the index of the character that you want to get. And so if I do name at index three, for example, what would you expect to see? Well, you'd probably expect to see a lowercase h. Right, and it's really helpful to have you know that table there, but you just have to be careful of that starting at zero rule because um, if you said a, then you are not following the rule. And of course, as I alluded to before, if you do something like name at index ten, you know it'll obviously give you uh, an error message, right? Because there's no there's no uh, there's no character at index ten, and so that won't work. And so that's all for that idea. We can now look at some basic string operations. Okay, we have this string name equals Noah, what can we do with it? Well, there's a lot of things that you can do with strings. There's a ton of things because, you know, string is, uh, is one of the most important basic types in Python or one of the most important types in Python. And so there's a ton of things that you can do with it. Um, but here's a few super simple ones to, to make it interesting. And so what you can do, uh, first, if you say name dot upper, and you put some parentheses, it will convert that into uppercase. And so if I do name dot upper, it will give me, whoops, it obviously won't give me that. It would give me this in all uppercase. So name dot upper would give me name and uppercase. And you can imagine what name dot lower would do. It would give me everything in lowercase. So, you know, in this case, the O-A-H got capitalized. And in this case, the N uh, became lowercase. And so if you call, you know, upper, if you use upper on a string that's already in all uppercase, nothing will happen. It'll give you the same string in all uppercase and same for lowercase. Um, but if you want to convert a string into all uppercase or all lowercase, you know, that's, that's the easiest way to do it. There's the in operator that you can use to check to see if a substring, you know, a smaller string is present within this string. And so I could ask the question, or I could say something like no in Noah, like that. So this is, you know, this is a question and it may not be clear, but if you actually try to use it, you would use this, you know, as a, as, as a question, you're checking a condition essentially. You're saying, is the string no in the string Noah? And so when we're dealing with questions that are either yes or no, or true or false, we're dealing with booleans. And so this will give a boolean response. It'll be true if that substring is there and false otherwise. So in this case, the substring is no, and the, the main string is Noah. And so obviously no is there, so it will give the answer true. And you should note that this is uh, case sensitive. So if I asked if you know no with a lowercase o is in Noah, it would say false, right? Because Noah has an uppercase N, not a lowercase N. What could you do? Well, you could convert Noah into lowercase by using dot lower, and then you could check. So there's one way that it's useful. You know, you could ask the user to enter two strings and you could check to see if, you know, 
one string is contained within the other, and if you want it to be case insensitive, you can convert them both into lowercase and, and go from there. And the last thing, and I'll write it, I'll write it over here because we have more room, is index. And what this will do is it will tell you where in the string you can find, you know, a substring or, or a letter or something. And so for example, if I did name dot index of O, I'm basically asking the question, where in the string is there a lowercase o? And so if we go back to this chart for just a second, we know that the O is at index one. And so the answer that this gives back will be one. And if I ask for a, a uh, you know, a letter that's not in there, if I said, where is the Z in there? It will give an error message, right? And so, you know, you'd probably want to, to deal with that in the case of an error message. There is also a function called find which will give negative one instead of an error. And so, you know, depending on which behavior you want, they both do the same thing, um, but one gives an error message and one gives the result negative one. So, you know, you could look at it if you want. And one other thing that I should note is if you have, you know, a word like boo, and you wanna know what's the index of the letter O, it's going to tell you one, which is this one. It's gonna give you the first index that it can find. So even though there are two O's, it's gonna find you know, the first one first, obviously, and so that's the result that it'll give back to you, is the number of them, is, uh, is the index of the first one. There is also, uh, there is also a method uh, or a function called count. Uh, it's a method. There's a method called count that you can use. Um, you know, if I, if I wanna count the number of O's, in this case, it would give me two. So it tells you the number uh, of times that this appears. One uh, other function that I actually forgot to write down that's super important is the len function. And the len means length. And so what that does is if you give it the, if you say len of, you know, some string, it will just tell you the number of characters in that string. So the len of the string Noah is four because there's four characters in it. And so that should be super straightforward, but that's definitely one uh, that you'll use very frequently. And so, yeah, there's, there's, there's a lot of functions beyond the simple ones that I'm demonstrating here. Uh, but the idea is, you know, you can, you can look them up online and, and you know, if, if the time calls for it, you know, you'll be able to, to use them. I just wanted to go over some of the basic ones because we're just talking about, you know, basic strings and that's all. Okay, so let's move on and look at the str function. Remember, str means string, and this function right here is actually pretty similar to the int and float functions. And so based on that, you can probably imagine, you know, what exactly it'll do. And so here's the idea. Let's say that I have, you know, people equals two. I have two people and let's say I want to treat that number like it's a string. And you know, one possible, one possible you know, reason is because let's say I have this variable uh, called message and it's equal to, uh, let's say it's equal to this message. There are people, people. So the idea is that this would fill in, you know, it would be the string there are and then it would be this number right here, and then the string people. So there are two people, for example. And if I change the variable to be three, it would say there are three people. So this variable called message is a string that contains the message there are x people, x is the number of people. So hopefully that's clear. Um, the problem is this will actually give an error message. And the reason why is because this is a string and this is an integer and we're trying to add a string and an integer together. And in some languages like Java, that's fine. But in uh, Python, it's not. We can only add strings to strings, right? We can't add integers to strings is the point. And so what happens is we get an error message. If we want to make this work, we need to, com we need to convert people to be a string because then we're doing string plus string and that'll work just fine. 
And so to do this, we use the str function. And again, it works in a similar way. So if I do str of x, you know, whatever x is, it will treat it like a string. And so to fix that, I would just do something like message is equal to there are, and now instead of just saying people, I want to say str people, right? So I'm putting uh, people inside of the str function. I'm saying take this integer and convert it to a string and then the word people. And so now this will not give an error. So no error, smiley face. Um, because now we're doing a string plus a string and that is obviously defined. It will concatenate them. It'll do there are and then it'll append to that. It will stick at the end of that, uh, you know, whatever the value of people is and then and then the word people, which is what we want. And so the point here is that there's this str function that works just like the int and float functions, but it converts uh, anything into a string and sometimes that's useful. So next, let's talk about two other functions called chr and ord. This is optional, and if it's too confusing, you don't really have to worry about it. Um, but this is sort of the basis of the lab that we're going to do. And so hopefully this will make enough sense. But essentially the idea is, you know, we're writing these, these nice strings, you know, for example, Noah. But we need some way to represent them in the computer because, you know, the computer at the bottom line, everything is a one or a zero. Um, and so we need a way to represent all of these. And there's a few different ways to represent it. Python uses a system called Unicode, and you may have heard of Unicode before. It's an incredibly um, robust uh, system, and basically it has you know letters, numbers, and symbols, but it also has characters from you know any language, even languages that you know aren't used anymore. It has mathematical symbols. It even has emoji in it. So if you're writing anything using emoji. Um, that is Unicode. And, you know, in order to understand Unicode, which has a ton of symbols and every symbol has a code point and, you know, you can't even, you couldn't imagine a, a table with everything in it. Um, we can think instead about ASCII, which we have right here. And ASCII is a simpler, um, you know, a simpler encoding. So, so Unicode and ASCII are encodings. They're, way of, uh, they're ways of translating these characters into numbers so that we can represent the numbers on a computer because computers deal with numbers, right? Um, now ASCII, this is the entire ASCII table. So this is all that you can represent using ASCII. Um, you know, we have some of the basic symbols right over here. We have the numbers. Here we have the uppercase uh, letters. And then here we have the lowercase letters. And there's 128 between 0 and 127. So there's 128 uh, of these characters, which is not that many, and that allows us to put them in a table. But the idea is, um, you know, ASCII will give us a good enough understanding of what's going on, and Unicode and ASCII agree with each other for the first 128 symbols. So, for example, 50 in ASCII is the number 2, and it's the same in Unicode. And then Unicode has a ton more symbols beyond that, but, but that's beside the point. And so what we would do then is, you know, we would go and we say, okay, this, this uppercase N, it's right here. It's number 78. Okay, how about this lowercase O? It's right here. It's number 111. How about this uppercase A? It's right here. It's 97. And then how about the lowercase H? And that is right here. And it's number 104. So if I were to represent my name in binary or in uh, in ASCII rather it would be 78 111 97 104 just like that and then you could convert each of these numbers into binary and now we have ones and zeros which is what the computer is good with you know dealing with and so you know this was a little bit tedious right we had to go through this entire table um, but python provides these two nice functions called chr and ord that will basically help us interface with this table if we ever needed to do it. And, you know, this, this doesn't come up all that much, but it does come up sometimes in programs that you write, and it's a useful thing to know. And at the very least, it'll help you understand how computers represent, you know, symbols, characters, which I think is interesting. And so anyways, look at the first one, which is chr. And so the way that chr works is chr takes a character and it gives you 
No. And so let's actually look at ORD first. Take a look at ORD first. And the way that ORD works is you give it a character, you give it one single letter, number, or symbol, and it will tell you its value in the ASCII table, right? You this 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 thing right here, it can't be more than one character long, or else you'll get an error message because it doesn't really make sense, um, right? But if I say lowercase a. Essentially, Python could go into this table and say, okay, here's the lowercase a, what's this number, 97, and so it returns 97. It gives the answer of 97. So the ORD function lets you convert from a character into its corresponding ASCII value, um, or it's really Unicode, right? We said, we, said, uh, we said Python uses Unicode, and so ORD, if you did ORD and you stuck an emoji in there, it would give you, you know, the Unicode code point, the Unicode number for the emoji. Um, but we're just dealing with ASCII right now because it's easier. And then the chr function does the exact opposite. So for example, if I did chr with 65, it would go into this table and say, okay, here is 65. What does that correspond to? Uh, it corresponds to an uppercase A. And so this would give me back the single character of A. And so basically, instead of having to, you know, manually deal with, you know, an ASCII table or Unicode, which would be impossible, we can use the ORD and CHR functions to convert from a character to its number representation and vice versa. So again, if that was confusing, you know, don't worry too much about it, but I think it's pretty clear um, and maybe the lab will make it even more clear if it wasn't clear enough. And uh, let's talk for a second about immutability, which sounds like a big word, but it's not quite as scary as it may sound. So essentially, the idea of immutability, if you haven't heard the word, maybe you've heard mutable or immutable before. Uh, so immutable means can't be changed, right? So immutability is the property, you know, that something can't be changed. And this is important. This is really important as to, um, as to how the string, uh, strings actually work. And so for example, if I were to take my name, Noah, and I call the upper function on it that we saw before, we said that this is going to, you know, give me the uppercase version of my name. And I just want to make this a little bit more clear. Let's say name is equal to Noah, and then let's call the function on this variable, because I really want to drive this point home. So we have this variable called name, which is a string, and we're calling name.upper. Well, here's what happens. Let's say that right after that, I you know, go ahead and print out the value of name. What do you think will print out? You know, I, you'd probably think that it would print out capital N, capital O, capital A, capital H, which is, you know, what you'd expect, but it actually doesn't do that. It actually prints out the same exact string as if nothing had happened to it. And the reason is because nothing has happened to it. The way that the upper function works is it will actually give you a new string that's in all uppercase, but it will leave the, the, the old one unmodified. And so what you'd have to do is you'd have to do something like name equals name.upper. So you're saying, I wanna reassign this variable to be equal to whatever it was before in uppercase. And so now when you go and print out the variable, it'll have you know the all uppercase, which you're expecting. And so that's really important. That's what the immutable, that's what immutability means. It can't be changed, which means that when you try to change a string, you can't, uh, you know, do, you can't actually change the string. Um, it will just create a copy of the string. And this is again, one of those things that may seem really weird. And, you know, you may think, you know, why does this happen? It doesn't make any sense. And again, it's one of those things where I'll tell you to trust me. What I can tell you is that it does help with memory usage because if you have you know, two strings that are the same, um, Python doesn't need to maintain two separate copies of that string because it knows that you can't change it, right? If you have, if you have the string hello in two different places in your code, you can't change that string because strings are immutable. And so you know, Python only needs to store one copy of that string in the memory, so it's more memory efficient. Um, and the other thing is this helps with, you know, multi-threading and, and other things, which is, you know, beyond the scope of, of these lectures. Um, but again, I guess just trust me, um, you know, strings are immutable. 
maybe it doesn't make sense, um, but, but you know, eventually maybe it will. And string immutability is pretty common, like, uh, you know, in Java, strings are also immutable, and it's the same in, you know, a lot of other languages. And so that's just an important point, is that if you, you know, just call, you know, name.upper, for example, it won't actually change the string, it'll just give you a copy of it, and you'd have to do something with the copy. And that's true of any function, upper, lower, um, you know, whatever. And that also means that you can't change individual uh, characters in a string. So you couldn't do something like name at index uh, zero is equal to uh, b, right? This won't work because we said strings are immutable. Um, so you'd have to actually create a copy of the string, which is a b plus the rest of my name. And that's something that we'll talk about you know, in a later lecture, but just to be clear about immutability. And the last thing that I'll show you is um, just sort of a nice feature that was added in Python 3.6. So you need to have Python 3.6 in order to use this, 3.6 or later. So the latest right now is 3.7, and that's totally fine. Oops, that's totally fine. Um, but basically, you know, we can actually use these things called f strings, which are format strings, to make lines of code like this look a little bit nicer. And so what we're doing is we're saying, you know, imagine that there's variables called name and age defined. So let's imagine, you know, let's just say name is equal to Noah, and let's say age is equal to 20. So this would print out my name is Noah and I am 20 years old. And here we're again, we're using the str function because uh, we need to convert from, you know, the integer 20 to the string 20 so we can put it in this sentence here. And so this is pretty simple and it's really not that bad, but we can use f strings to make it look a little bit nicer. And so we can write this line equivalently and here's what it would look like. So when you're using an f string, it's just like a normal string, but before, right before the opening quotation mark, you write the letter f, which might look a little bit weird, but that's how it goes. So it's f and then quotation mark. And then you go ahead and we can write our string like normal, my name, is but now we want to stick a variable in this is called string interpolation it means we want to put a variable into our string we want to interpolate the variable so you don't have to remember that word but it's string interpolation and so the way that this happens is instead of ending the string and you know plus whatever plus continue we can actually just use a set of curly braces and i know my curly braces are weird but those are curly braces so we can write my name is name and we can pick up right where we left off, and I am. And then for age, we don't need to explicitly convert it into a string. We can just write age in there, and Python will deal with that. Years old. We end the string, and we close the parenthesis. And so these two lines are equivalent, and as long as you're using uh, Python 3.6 or later, so I'll make that note, Python 3.6 plus, uh, as long as you are using Python 3.6 or later, you can use f strings and they make stuff look a little bit nicer. Now, f strings also has, have uh, other features that I'm not going to cover right now um, that you know can make the formatting very nice. Um, but just if you find yourself doing this a lot and you get tired of writing all of these pluses and having to deal with your opening and closing um, you know quotation marks, you could use an f string, and I think that they actually look pretty nice. And so that's all for this lecture. I know that it was pretty long, um, but now you should have a better understanding of how strings work in Python. So in the lab, we will do a little bit of work with strings to um, you know, get a fuller understanding, make sure that we totally understand it, and then we'll move on. So I hope this all made sense, and I'll see you guys in the next one.